second day of the 29th Democratic National Convention. The National Broadcasting Company is greeting you again from the Chicago Stadium. And this is Ben Grauer reporting from the NBC booth overlooking the scene of action as the big day begins. And a big day it certainly promises to be. Today is the day the Democrats in National Assembly will affirm their party's platform and will select as their candidate the uh, officers for the country's highest position. The convention and the nation is known for days. Franklin D. Roosevelt will be returned again as their choice for President of the United States. But as the 1,176 delegates file into the red wooden seats of this giant auditorium right now, there's no clear majority of them who have decided, either by direction or their own decision, who the choice for Vice President is. The race is still wide open, with Senator Harry Truman and Senate the Majority Leader Alban Barkley, the leading the Majority Leader Alban Barkley, the leading the Majority Leader Alban Barkley, the leading contenders, and Vice President Henry Wallace still very much in the contest. Today's sessions promise much that's exciting and dramatic, and a certainty that from the busy floor of this convention hall will come decisions of great political importance. And again, NBC is ready to bring you the proceedings in highlight and in detail. Manning our microphones, placed strategically at vantage points throughout the stadium, are members of NBC's staff of commentators and observers. Right alongside me here in the booth is Robert St. John. Uh, Robert's been sticking particularly close to the vice presidential tussle, and we'll want a word from him in a moment. Uh, down below us on the speaker's platform is the well-known dean of commentators, H.V. Kaltenborn. And on roving assignments on the convention floor are Richard Harkness, Morgan Beatty, and Don Fisher of NBC's staff. All of them equipped with portable shortwave transmitters, ready to bring you action and comment from the delegates right there in their seats. In any moment, the convention session will begin under the chairmanship of temporary chairman, Governor Robert Kerr of Oklahoma. And uh, already the convention hall is fairly well filled. I'd say that about uh, 50% of the delegates have taken their places, and we have out of the some 20,000 seats available here in the Chicago Stadium, oh, about 10 or 8 to 10,000 filled. There'll be more and more action as this session goes along, including the address by the permanent chairman, Senator Robert Jackson of Indiana, and the, the, the uh, report of the Resolutions Committee on the platform from the Democratic uh, National Committee for 1944. Tonight, the address will be delivered, addresses will be delivered by Helen Gage and Douglas, and by Quentin Reynolds, and the speech of acceptance is expected by the President of the United States, following his nomination for, again, for President of the United States by the Democrats in convention here this evening. After that, it is expected in the uh, program agenda as it is being worked out now that the highly crucial balloting for Vice President will take place. But that all lies strictly in the realm of conjecture, and to give you a little clairvoyant view into that, I'm going to ask Robert St. John alongside us to appraise the situation in the Vice Presidential possibilities as they stand now. Mr. St. John. Thanks, Ben. First, let me tell you that a piece of strictly non-political news caused a great deal of excitement here in the convention this morning. That bulletin which came in from London that said that Adolf Hitler had been slightly burned and bruised and re had received a light brain concussion and that a number of his army and navy officers had been injured when an attempt with explosives was made on the life of the Fuhrer. Uh, nearly all the delegates had picked up that story by word of mouth or by radio, uh, before they got into the hall, and that was one of the things they were talking about. The other thing they were uh, they were talking about was, of course, the vice presidential race. Uh, yesterday afternoon, it looked as if uh, Henry Wallace was losing ground, but this morning he's hit the comeback trail. Uh, Kansas, with 16 convention votes, previously unpledged, has caucus, uh, caucused and balloted unanimously in favor of the former Secretary of Agriculture, now Vice President of the United States. And then the North Dakota delegation with eight votes caucused, and it also unanimously endorsed Henry Wallace. But on the other side, uh, Senator Truman uh, picked up some support when Postmaster General Frank Walker uh, told reporters this morning, I am for Truman. After all, Walker is a member of the, of the cabinet. And then the uh, Democratic National Committee uh, treasurer from the state of California told us here this morning that he had presidential approval in telling his California delegation that Franklin D. Roosevelt is convinced Truman will cost him fewer votes than any other candidate for vice president. And now back to Ben Grower. At this moment, 
the temporary chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Governor Robert Kerr of Oklahoma, a big, giant-sized man, has stepped to the center of the platform, to the speaker's rostrum, and we will have the national anthem. We'll take you to the speaker's platform. Mona Van. national anthem by the delegates standing soberly at attention and led from the speaker's rostrum by Miss Mona Van of the Chicago Civic Opera Company. One of the interesting and colorful ceremonies attendant to these sessions of the Democratic National Convention uh, is the uh, lowering of the massive giant-sized Klieg lights when the anthem is sung and as the ringing words of the Star Spangled Banner sound out over this giant hall the crowd is hushed, stands quietly, thoughtfully, and uh, ranged along the mezzanines and balconies of the auditorium is a series of some 56 red, white, and blue neon lights. They're hardly noticeable. Your attention isn't attracted to them while the attention isn't attracted to them while the attention isn't attracted to them while the full lights are on. But when the pleagues go down and the voices ring out and the hush descends upon the auditorium. Those prophetic V for Victory lights are plainly to be seen. Spotlighted high in the stratospheric ceiling of the Chicago Stadium is a giant American flag. I'd say it's about 60 by 40 feet. And a brilliant white spotlight picks that up alongside the band, which is up there in the rafters, the American Legion Band, which accompanies these renditions of the national anthem. And now a quick glance around the convention floor shows us that it's filling up fairly rapidly. The two center sections are practically completely filled. I see a number of vacancies in several state delegations, but others are almost complete. Uh, looking over at the Texas delegation, which was the scene of much excitement and uh, interest uh, last night, uh, comparative, in fact, actual calm is uh, reigning. Uh, the uh, regulars who have been seated by the Democratic Committee and whose... Uh, Credentials will be passed upon, and undoubtedly without any disturbance by the committee and credentials in just a few moments, uh, fell into some sort of discussion with the uh, representatives of the Rump Texas delegation who were parading with signs saying clean house in Texas and so on. This all occurred during a spontaneous demonstration of party fidelity evoked by the ringing words of Governor Kerr in his keynote speech last night as he signaled, signalized the magnificent military exploits of the armed forces under the commander-in-chief ship of President Roosevelt. That gave us one of the most exciting and thrilling of the demonstrations we've had spontaneously touched off here on the Chicago Stadium floor. Much more is expected. There are promises to come along in the ensuing moments. This uh, today, 
Following the address by permanent chairman Jackson of Indiana, we will go into the uh, business of roll call for presidential nominations, which will bring us the first presidential nominating speeches and the roll call, and then on to the actual balloting. Down on the platform, alongside Governor Carr of Oklahoma, who is at this moment conducting some of the routine proceedings in connection with the convention, is H.B. Kaltenborn, and in this pause in the actual proceedings, I'm going to call on him for some observations. I should like to say just a word about the attempt on Hitler's life. It runs on a par with previous attempts in that it was not directed against Hitler alone, but against the clique immediately surrounding Hitler. You will remember that when Hitler had his reunion in the famous beer hall in Munich, there was a previous attempt upon his life. That, too, was not directed alone against Hitler, but against the men who are in immediate contact with him. The reason for that is this. This attempt is undoubtedly inspired by a group in the Nazi party that feels that things are going badly, that the clique now in control must be removed before they can go better. It is the first indication of that split in the internal unity of Germany, which presage, presages division, revolt, and ultimate defeat. It is the sort of thing that's going to run on parallel now with the defeats at the front, and we can expect more of it. That is, that is the significance. It is not that it is simply an attempt to assassinate Hitler. It is an indication of division in high German councils and the attempt to get something out of the way in order that something else may come into control. Just a word on the vice presidential situation. It seems to me as the thing lines up that it's going to be extremely difficult for Wallace to overcome the situation as it stands now. After all, there are four states that hold the vice presidential key. They are New York, where boss Edward J. Flynn is in favor of the senator, Senator Truman. There is the state of Illinois, where Mayor Kelly is in favor of Senator Truman. There is the state of New Jersey, where Boss Haig is in favor of Senator Truman. There is the state of Missouri, where Chairman Hannigan, as you heard him say over this microphone at the close of last night's session, he is in favor of Senator Truman. Now, this morning, you heard from Robert St. John that Postmaster Walker is in favor of Senator Truman. You heard the statement from the treasurer of the Democratic Committee that President Roosevelt has advised him that Senator Truman would cost him fewer votes than anyone else in the position of vice president. We'll add that all together, and it seems to me that since this is a Roosevelt convention, the votes cannot go in any other way except to Senator Truman. Now back to the NBC booth. Back in the booth, and while H.B. Kaltenborn has been talking to you from the speaker's platform, we've had word flashed up to us from the convention floor. One of our observers has gone over to the Iowa delegation, and we've found that, uh, as yet... Uh, Vice President Henry Wallace, who is chairman of that delegation, incidentally, and who is here as a delegate to the convention. Vice President Wallace has not yet arrived and is not seated in the delegation as yet. Uh, the appearance of Mr. Wallace yesterday at last night's session, some ten minutes before the session actually began, uh, was the was the, the sign of, the, of a, somewhat of a demonstration or at least a warm greeting from many members of the convention here assembled. Uh, the Iowa delegation was a focus of interest, and uh, many delegations, uh, delegates left their uh, state and uh, moved over to uh, have a word with uh, Vice President Wallace to say hello and so on. Uh, somewhere is on this floor, I can't pick him out now, but we'll have him on the air in just a moment, is one of NBC staff commentators, Richard Harkness, with a portable shortwave transmitter. Uh, come in, Richard Harkness, will you, and tell us where you are. And this is Richard Harkness on the floor of the convention. I am standing here right within arm's reach of the Iowa delegation in the middle aisle, away from the platform, here on the floor. Uh, Vice President Wallace has not arrived at convention hall this morning as yet. The word here is that he is conferring with some of his supporters and leaders in uh, his hotel room downtown. There's an unusually heavy attendance here on the convention floor this morning for a morning session. Usually the delegates don't like to get up quite this early and come out to what promises to be only another speech. 
However, they have turned out in force this morning. I think that can be explained by the fact that there is an air of tetanus and an air of excitement here on the convention floor this morning. They got off to a good rip-roaring start last night, as you heard and read in your morning papers. And this morning, that same excitement has carried over. Here on the floor, the delegates are talking and speculating largely about Mr. Roosevelt's acceptance speech. They are wondering not only what he will say about platforms and issues this year and what he'll say about the war, they're also very interested in what he may say about his choice for vice president, his, his running mate on the 1944 National Democratic ticket. Uh, Mayor Kelly of Chicago, the Democratic chieftain here, is trying to, has thrown Illinois, has thrown Illinois to Senator Truman. The word is that Edwin Pauley of California, that the Californians may support Senator Truman too, and support them because, as they say, President Roosevelt thinks that Senator Truman would cost the Democratic ticket less votes than would Vice President Wallace if he were running again. The word here, too, is that possibly there may be a hot fight over the party platform this afternoon, a little later in this session. The word from the Stevens Hotel, where the platform committee is meeting, is that there is an argument over the racial equality plank to the platform. The one word is that the platform may promise equality of voting for white and Negro citizens. If that is true, there may be a revolt from the South, especially from the states of Texas, South Carolina, and Mississippi. This is Richard Harkness returning you to the NC NBC booth. Back again in the booth, the uh, convention floor scene is picking up a little as we come close to the major business of this morning's session, a, uh, the address by the permanent chairman, Senator Sam Jackson of Indiana. Meanwhile, temporary chairman Kerr is uh, carrying on these routine proceedings and introduced varying dis introducing various distinguished guests. I spotted Attorney General Francis Biddle, who's left the Pennsylvania delegation for a moment to come up here on the speaker's platform, chatting with high officials of the Democratic National Committee. There is George Allen, former District Commissioner of the District of Columbia. And I see Senator Jackson, too, has made his appearance and is waiting to be introduced. Madam Perkins, Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins, is here with a, another variation of a familiar three-cornered hat. And uh, the scene is moving along with the excitement and brilliance that we eventually get here in these sessions of the convention, of the National Convention. Looking up on the uh, uh, walls of the convention hall, there are no signs except just one large strip of, of photographs mark Democratic presidents running from Jefferson through Jackson, Tyler, Polk, Cleveland, Wilson, up to Roosevelt. Uh, I see former Senator Minton of Indiana has just come onto the platform, and uh, there's a bit of excitement from the newsreel and photographic boys. They're flicking the shutters and flashing the bulbs, as they always do. There's good uh, spirit, bon ami, here at this Democratic National Convention. The delegates are in particularly good mood. We haven't had the blistering heat we had three weeks ago at the Republican Convention. In fact, everyone seems to be in pretty good humor, except I noticed the pretty young ladies who are selling uh, war bond boutonnieres uh, for a dollar each, and uh, they haven't been selling them as happily or as rapidly as they'd want to. So I bought one, a lot of us did. Down on the speaker's platform again is a word of interest for you. We take you then to the speaker's platform. Thank you very much. We return for, to the booth for just a moment to introduce the next speaker, the permanent chairman of the Democratic National Convention, Senator Samuel Jackson of Indiana. Senator Jackson is raising the giant-sized gavel and pounding it. He's posing for just a moment for the photographers. He says, that's enough, boys, but they want one, two, three, five more. And here is Chairman Jackson with his official speech as opening his tenureship of the office of permanent chairman of the Democratic National Convention. The organ plays, the lights are shining. Uh, some of the delegates have uh, taken off their coats because it has warmed up a little bit here under the Klieg lights and the excitement and the press of the crowd. And in a moment, we'll have Senator Jackson. Delegates, 
to the Democratic National Convention and my fellow Americans. I am profoundly grateful for the high honor with which you invest me as permanent chairman of this great assembly. My appreciation of this post, great as it is, pales before the responsibility which I share with every other delegate in this convention. No convention since the birth of the Republic has had such grave significance. We meet to submit the future of America to the patriotic people of our nation for their decision. Their decision may determine the course of civilization itself. We are about to make a declaration of principles and present the candidacy of a man to guide our destinies for the next four years. We meet in the faith that this man, when elected, can and will continue to carry forward without interruption the tremendous burden of the war. We meet in the firm belief that mankind is not doomed to a perpetual fear that each generation must send its millions to meet death in order to preserve liberty. We meet in the confidence that the man this convention selects for president will direct our men-at-arms to the speediest possible victory. He will help write the terms of an abiding peace. We meet with the conviction that that peace will be established by men who know the forces involved, not by uninformed, inexperienced, or irresponsible politicians. There may have been previous years, previous election years, in which it was not of overwhelming importance as to which of the two national parties selected the President of the United States. We have, on a few occasions in the past, muddled through with commonplace and less than commonplace presidents. While they have created scandal, delayed progress, or wrought economic havoc, a dozen years or so of painstaking labor, erased resultant damage, corrected errors, and placed the nation again upon our appointed way. But this is not 1920. It is not 1924, not 1928. This is fateful 1944. A change in national administration in time of war, even when surrounded by promising circumstances, is frightening to contemplate it is dangerous to make. If it were true that the Republican nominee is as able, as experienced, as definite in his indicated principles of government, and as clear in his war and peace concepts as the present occupant of the White House, still exchange now might well prove to be the tragedy of this generation. In terms of statesmanship, a comparison of the apparent dimensions of the GOP aspirant 
with a man of the stature of the president rolls out of the field of rational consideration this proposed substitution for the party of Franklin D. Roosevelt. We are in the midst of the fiercest, most devastating war mankind has ever known. America cannot afford to take a chance. Our people will not gamble with the lives of their sons, your sons, and mine. Some there are who would have us believe that we and our noble allies already have our enemies vanquished, their morale shattered, and their power destroyed. But our military authorities tell us that is not true. These authorities say that tremendous battles loom large between us and the ultimate surrender of enemy arms or even the destruction of enemy morale. America will win this war finally and completely no matter who is elected President of the United States next November. But how many battleships would a Democrat defeat be worth Tahiro Hito? How many Nazi legions would it be worth to Adolf Hitler? Frankly, could Goebbels do better himself to bolster Axis morale than the word that the American people had upset this administration, the administration that made it possible for the Russians to drive the Nazis back to the Prussian border? We must not allow the American ballot box to be made Hitler's secret weapon. <laughs> Under the most favorable circumstances, an administrative change we know from experience would mean change all the way down the official line. Change means interruption. Interruption means delay. Every day of delay means the sacrifice of more American lives. It means more telegrams reading. We, the, uh, the Adjutant General, regrets to inform you. Yes. Every day costs the lives of more American boys. The American electorate will not vote for change, interruption, and delay. <laughs> to counteract the disadvantage of having such an unusually young and unpracticed candidate for the presidency, his supporters are endeavoring to make an asset of a liability. His nominator stressed the point, they, the American people, want youth instead of decadence. That last word, decadence, is an indecent slander if intended for the president. Roosevelt is in his full vigor and in the flower of his energy. He has more rugged vitality in him today than any two men the opposition has to offer. Franklin D. Roosevelt is the most valuable public servant in the world today. <laughs> Governor D. 
Dewey was not nominated because of his youth, as they say, but in spite of it. He was selected because he was the governor of New York. His selection was motivated, was not motivated by any abstract purpose of having youth serve America. He was picked in the hope that the 47 electoral votes of New York State would carry the old guard back into the White House. In precluding ourselves from the services of any man who in some great emergency shall be deemed universally most capable of serving the public. That great emergency is with us now. Our adversaries go back to their overworked watchword of many campaigns that only Republicans are capable of dealing with the domestic problems of federal administration. Well, we know from bitter experience where their expertness in that field led us. After three uninterrupted terms in charge of the government, that expertness led us into the depths of depression. President Hoover had no slide rule with which to find his way out of that disastrous quagmire. The country turned from the great engineer to a Democrat. The country will not turn back from that Democrat to the pupil of the great engineer. Need we recite the swift method by which Roosevelt, from that day of his inauguration, stemmed the calamitous tide and started us toward economic security and adequate defense? But the old guard simply wails, how long shall we keep the Democratic Party in Washington? How long until the escutcheons of this government shall have been cleansed of the debauchery of the Harding regime? How long until the economic and financial structures of this republic shall have been healed of and protected against the return of the rampant and unchecked piracy during the do-nothing administration of Calvin Cooley. How long until the farmer, businessman, and worker shall have been insured against a recurrence of the devastation wrought by the unfortunate and unsung administration of Mr. Hoover? How long until that permanent peace promised to the heroes of the First World War shall have been kept in spirit and in truth? How long until all these high ends shall have been reached? or until the people shall have lost faith in their accomplishment, for there is not a mustard seed of hope for their achievement in the promises made in this stadium last month by the party of Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover. We are confident of victory at the polls. Our confidence springs from appreciation of what a democratic administration, through years of stress, has done for our country. This confidence 
springs from the sentiment of the business world when it contemplates its sound, usual, peacetime prosperity. This confidence springs from the farmer who remembers the starvation prices he got for his product until the futile, feeble, faltering Republican regime gave way to the courageous, definite, and far-sighted Roosevelt policy. It is deepened by the comparison the farmer makes of these prices with the prices of his grain and livestock today. This confidence springs from the worker who finds himself for the first time in history guarded against the exactions of conscienceless exploitation. We have a right to be confident. But let us not be overconfident. For by that sin, off-year elections have been lost. Because Democratic voters have considered victory won, they have neglected to do their full share. We shall leave this, conviction, this convention hall <clears throat> touched with the livid fire of conviction that we will win because we deserve to win. We shall, we shall not only ensure against a disastrous overconfidence, but we shall make our victory so total that the hungry opposition will realize that their attempt to turn back the clock to the days of privilege and pillage is absolutely vain and will continue to be absolutely vain. Just 45 days ago, the greatest military expedition of all time crossed the choppy waters of the English Channel and landed on the beaches of Normandy. There was launched the genius, the sacrifice, and three and a half years of the toil of our people. That flotilla of 4,000 ships and 11,000 aircraft carried the best trained and the best soldiers we have ever sent to war. They are our boys. Our hearts, our tears, our prayers, and our hopes are all with them. Mourning and so sorrow are the lot of many today who have already lost their beloved on the field of battle. Multitudes more will be numbered among the bereaved as death stalks the way to liberation. How many more, or who else shall fall, no one knows. But while we await the outcome of their complete endeavor, in the name of heaven, now in the midst of their rendezvous with destiny, let us not take from them their commander-in-chief. We have returned to the NBC booth overlooking the speaker's rostrum at the conclusion of this 35-40 minute address by the permanent chairman of the convention, Senator Sam Jackson of Indiana. The senator, a slight figure in a cool white suit or summer wear, is receiving congratulations from Governor Kerr and from other officials here on the platform. And we're having some sort of a mild demonstration on the convention floor. Uh, waving of arms and uh, throwing up of programs by the uh, delegates 
and uh, they are warmly applauding the address just concluded of Senator Jackson. In fact, the senator has just returned to the uh, rostrum to acknowledge the applause, and he's bowing and smiling to them. The orchestra and the band have struck up a tune. Uh, two or three of the state banners have been taken from their post at the corner of the delegation and are being waved in the air by the delegate. And uh, we have a mild enthusiasm being displayed here on the floor. Uh, this whole session this morning has been marked by moderate enthusiasm, uh, by no means equaling the excitement and tension we had last night perhaps also being due to the large number of entertainments and parties which were given by uh, uh, various officials throughout Chicago last night after the convention. In fact, uh, one of the highlights of the uh, uh, post-session uh, proceedings last night was the party, a large buffet and reception given by the genial host uh, of the convention, uh, Mayor Ed Kelly of Chicago. Uh, myself and a large number of NBCites attended and found the mayor's uh, hospitality flow warmly and, and expansively. And that may account for a general air of sedateness which pervades the hall. Let that be by no means a gauge of what will ensue in the next hour or so. Because uh, uh, the room is filled with smoke-filled rumors. Uh, in fact, there are all kinds of tensions and whisperings and uh, suggestions uh, scurrying uh, throughout the hall. The uh, vice presidential situation is still extremely up in the air. And the candidacy or the uh, possibility of being nominated of uh, both Senator Truman and of Vice President Wallace is still entirely possible. And uh, Senator Barkley, by the way, we have just been informed, who is another of the leading contenders for the vice presidential position, did take his place in the Kentucky delegation uh, some moments ago. He has, however, left uh, the Kentucky delegation and gone down under the platform to uh, change his suit, we are told, to prepare for his appearance before the convention when he will have the honor, which was his four years ago, of placing the name of President Roosevelt in nomination for the presidency again. He probably will be wearing another of those uh, white summer suits which he wore four years ago in Chicago when he placed the name of uh, President Roosevelt before the convention at that time. Senator Barkley is uh, a leading contender, as we say, for the vice presidential candidacy on the Kentucky delegation. Looking over to the middle aisle, we see a veritable jam of uh, delegates and uh, I think members of the press, too, and officials who are going to the New York delegation and to the Missouri delegation, which is the headquarters of information about Senator Truman. And over in the New York delegation, I see the tall, broad-shouldered figure and the bald pate and smiling countenance of Jim Farley. Uh, Jim Farley has taken his place in the New York delegation. He's surrounded well, by reporters. He, I uh, presume, has no comment to make at this time. Similarly, when we quizzed Senator Barkley a moment the, uh, ago whether he would have to, whether he would make any statement, he said, "I'll have no comment. Uh, my next uh, comment will be the placing of the name of President Roosevelt in nomination." Uh, all this scene is uh, changing rapidly with uh, these rumors and suggestions and possibilities developing and subsiding for a moment. And uh, now I see that the uh, applause at the conclusion of Senator Activity Jackson's speech has uh, subsided. Uh, the delegates are taking their places. The uh, uh, sergeant at arms are now trying to clear that very important center aisle where so much of the news and information flows. Right alongside there on the speaker's platform is H.V. Kaltenborn, and we'll switch down to Mr. Kaltenborn right now. I've just had a bulletin handed me which states that James A. Farley, the man who fought a third-term nomination for President Roosevelt, plans to protest against a fourth by voting for Senator Harry F. Byrd of Virginia. I've also just received a report on the caucus of the Tennessee delegation, which concerns the platform. The Tennessee delegation voted against approval of the race and religious platform flank. That plank was read to the delegation by Senator McKellar. It calls for the right of all races, religions, and creeds to live and vote equally with all other citizens. That is one of the most liberal racial planks that has ever been brought before a democratic convention. The Tennessee delegation caucused on it and decided to vote against it. It is my understanding that it is definitely incorporated in the platform as that platform will be reported here today and consequently there will be some kind of a fight on the floor against that particular clause of the platform 
unless by some last-minute compromise it is removed or changed. Back to the NBC booth. Right now on the speaker's rostrum, uh, routine business of the convention is proceeding before the next important highlight, the report on the Committee of Credentials, and following that, the report on the Committee on Platform and Resolutions. That will be the platform uh, report of which Mr. Carlton Bourne has spoken a moment ago. It's not clear at this moment whether the platform will be ready in time. It is being mimeographed right now and whether it will be ready to be presented to the convention. It's entirely possible that the nominating speech of Governor, of Senator Barkley, will be given before the platform committee report is presented. However, uh, pre predating that, there's a possibility of some interest and excitement uh, developing when the Committee on Credentials makes its report with the uh, very moot seating of the Texas delegation. That uh, flamed into action last night with what approached uh, the possibility of a bit of fisticuffs over there in the Texas delegation as, Senate, as Dan Mooney, the former governor of Texas, who heads the regulars, the Texas regulars who are seated, exchanged words and... Uh, uh, opinions with those who are presenting the uh, banners asking for the removal of this regularly seated delegation. Uh, those banners, incidentally, bore signs, uh, clean house in Texas. We in Texas want Roosevelt. And one particularly which roused the ire of the regulars seated here in the convention was sweep the Judases out of Texas. And I understand that there was um, much excitement and tension going on down there. And as we watched it here on the floor, a possibility of an open fight, but it did not develop. However, a parliamentary tussle is in the offing and uh, probably will develop when that report on the, of the Committee of Credentials is presented to the convention. Alongside us is Bob St. John, who's been running through the latest bulletins as they develop and has some comments to make at this moment. Bob. Thanks, Ben Grower. Here are some last-minute uh, developments. Senator Guy Gillette of Iowa, who has stayed away from this convention because of his opposition to a fourth term for President Roosevelt, has just telegraphed an offer to help Vice President Henry Wallace in his campaign. His telegram read, I'm ready to help anywhere I am needed. Uh, Wallace has remained in his uh, hotel rooms all the morning, uh, doing uh, that uh, smoke-filled conference room business, receiving callers, lining up votes. Uh, his campaign manager has uh, just let the word creep out that they are ready at any time uh, for the vote on the vice uh, presidency. That would seem to indicate great confidence. They claim they have 400 votes lined up already. Of course, that isn't enough for the nomination, but uh, it's more than anyone else has. The governor of Georgia was one of the callers on the Vice President Wallace this morning, and he uh, said that unless President Roosevelt tells the convention in writing that he's changed his mind and no longer wants Wallace as his running mate, he and the Wallace forces assume the vice president still has Mr. Roosevelt's blessing and they're going to stick with him. Now, the Illinois delegation is caucused. In 58 votes they have, they voted to go for Senator Lucas of Illinois for vice president until they're released by somebody else. Now let's see if there aren't some other... Oh, here uh, is an announcement that uh, Senator Byrd, Senator Harry F. Byrd of Virginia, will be placed in nomination for the presidency later today by Mrs. Fred Nooney of Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, we've been told that James A. Farley is going to cast his vote for that candidate for Senator Byrd rather than for President Roosevelt, with whom he broke. And here's another little item that says that Senator Eastland has predicted that Mississippi's votes for the vice presidency will be switched to Truman whenever it becomes apparent that their favorite son, Sam Jones, cannot win the vice presidency. And now I switch you back to Ben Grower. While Bob St. John's been talking, uh, Chairman Jackson has introduced several distinguished guests just a moment ago. He called up from the platform onto the rostrum uh, the lion of, of publicity and public relations of the Democratic National Committee, the Venerable Charles Michelson, the tall, gaunt, gray-haired figure in glasses and studious face. And he, uh, Charlie Michelson, walked to the center, or to the rostrum, rather, and took a very warm round of applause from the audience here. Uh, the next, uh, just a moment ago, 
Their resolution of thanks to Governor Kerr of Oklahoma for his tenure of office as temporary chairman was introduced by the Honorable Lon Duckworth of Georgia, and uh, the report of the Committee on Rules and Order of Business is going forward now. Uh, strictly routine proceedings, uh, sort of parliamentary moving back and forth, which will be uh, accomplished in a few moments, and the next two important orders of business will then come up on the platform. They are the report of the Committee on Credentials, involving the contested seating of the Texas delegation and the possibility of there being a fight on that report and then the report of the Committee on Platform and Resolutions, which will be delivered by the Honorable John McCormick of Massachusetts, Majority Leader of the House of Representatives. Um, there is a little excitement now in the Oklahoma delegation. Uh, the Oklahoma delegation is cheering... Uh, songs from the show of the same name, which made uh, the name of the state of Oklahoma a uh, worldwide and world love. It had, was a, oh, what a beautiful morning for Governor Kerr himself yesterday uh, in his uh, keynote speech when he was so warmly received by the convention audience and when they tipped off a tremendous uh, demonstration as he spoke of the vitality and spirit of Roosevelt's leadership in the armed forces of the United States. The convention have, uh, auditorium itself has been filling up. Uh, we had only about uh, 8,000 people here out of the some 20,000 seats available, but now there's a goodly number of them sifting into their chairs, uh, visitors and guests, and most of the boxes are filled directly opposite us on the north side of the stadium, and also the uh, row after row of press seats, hard, straight, pine seats, uh, serviceable and utilitarian, they're filling up too. Incidentally, those seats were here for the Republican National Convention, uh, some 200,000 feet of priority lumber, which Andy Crane and the other gentlemen who take charge of arrangements here in the uh, convention hall sought to have stayed right in their place. Down on the platform, H.B. Uh, Kaltenborn's been listening to Senator Jackson and making some notes on the address which the permanent chairman just gave, and uh, we'd like to have Mr. Kaltenborn's comments at this time. Well, there's a very interesting contrast between the fire and brimstone speech of Governor Kerr last night and the much more quiet talk that the Honorable Samuel D. Jackson gave us today. Jackson is no rabble-rouser like Governor Kerr. His delivery is much more quiet. And in particular, there is no aptness in his phrasing. There were no epigrams. There were no alliterative phrases such as cooling with Coolidge and hardening with Harding and hungering with Hoover that caught the fancy of the convention last night. He did not bring the convention to its feet, and at the close, the applause was not particularly spontaneous, although there was a friendly response, and one by one the various delegations rose to their feet. Um, the inability of a speaker in this tremendous auditorium to point up his phrases and to deliver them with a tremendous bang is the thing that sometimes fails to let even an excellent speech get over with any particular effect. It was a straightforward, workmanlike job, but a political speech without highlights. And here, highlights are needed to rouse the interest of the delegations. I should say that at least half of them paid comparatively little attention. Well, as I went through the speech and tried to pick out the high points, I found that there were comparatively few. For example, the first point was that democratic defeat is a victory for Japan and Germany. Then he went on to tell us that Dewey was inexperienced said that the Republican senators were those who balked Wilson's peace efforts. Well, they weren't all Republicans. Said that the GOP opposed all constructive steps, then quoted Washington in favor of the fourth term. Well, it would be easy to quote half a dozen Democratic platforms which made declarations against even a second term. He contrasted Hoover's mistakes with Roosevelt's achievements, and then finally warned against overconfidence. That was a good point, because as matters stand today, it's impossible for either party to be absolutely sure that it's going to win in November. Now back to the NBC booth. 
While H.P. Uh, Kaltenborn's been talking, the band's been playing selected state airs, and each state has stood up as its uh, state song was played and uh, uh, bowed to the audience. We just had a song from Georgia. Right now, deep in the heart of Texas, is ringing out over the convention floor, and the large Texas delegation has stood up in its place and waving the Texas banner. Looking over towards the Texas delegation, I see Richard Harkness, NBC's analyst, right down there on the convention floor with a shortwave transmitter. So we'll switch down to you now, Mr. Harkness. And this is Richard Harkness on the convention floor, and I am literally in the heart of Texas down here. I'm right in the middle of the Texas delegation. They're staging a little demonstration of their own, which was touched off when the band and organ played the tune deep in the heart of Texas. This convention started off in a rather dull mood this morning. It is a little tough diet to have an hour, almost an hour of political oratory right after your breakfast. But now the convention is getting het up, as you might say, and anything may happen. These Texans are waiting here in a rather uh, belligerent mood. They don't want any trouble, but uh, if there is trouble, they'll have some of it for the Credentials Committee to bring in its report. As, as its report should be in shortly, I return you now to the NBC booth. We've been telling you that we're not too sure just what the next order of business will be, whether it will be the committee reports or the nominating speech for uh, by Senator Barkley. The uh, best idea in the world would be to go to the head man, and the head man right now is seated at an NBC microphone, the permanent chairman of this convention, Senator Sam Jackson of Indiana. So we're going to switch down to the platform and to Senator Jackson. Go ahead, Senator, Senator Jackson, Jackson I've just yes. had the privilege of telling the radio audience what a workmanlike speech you delivered over these microphones. Now, here you are to speak for yourself directly to the NBC audience. I wish you'd tell us a little something about the proceedings for the rest of today. Well, Mr. Kellenburn, first let me thank you for a very fine compliment, not only because of what you've said, but because of its author. I appreciate that. Now, as to today, uh, Mr. Kellenborn, we're waiting now on two chairmen of two committees. They are not entirely routine matters either. One of them is a report on the rules and order of business, which might bring up the two-thirds rule effort to substitute two-thirds rule for the majority rule on nominations. And then the other is the platform, and they're not here yet. The chances are they're in a hotel room right this minute giving the finishing touches to uh, the text. And we hope it'll be here in a few minutes. Meanwhile, I'm surprised if these people can hear anything we say on account of the way Dixie has taken over the entire convention hall. But to get back to what you asked me, uh, as soon as those uh, items of business are out of the way, there will be the nomination for the President of the United States. If that concludes at a reasonable late hour this afternoon, there will be a recess until about 8.30 tonight. And then tonight, after the President accepts the nomination, uh, as we understand he is to do, we will go into the nomination for Vice President. And then we'll grind at that until parliamentary uh, situations uh, change the course of events or until we finish. Do you think that you're going to be able to finish tonight sometime? Well, if you'll give me a little slice of tomorrow morning and call it tonight, I'll say yes. Good. Everybody, I think, who's on the working end of the uh, convention likes the idea of going through with the night session and winding her up instead of coming back for another day. But I'm told that our good host... Mayor Kelly would rather have us stay here for another day. Uh, we won't get into the motives, but I will agree with your implication that uh, staying late at night puts a sort of a cap chief on the dramatics of the situation. Quite right. Let me ask you this question about procedure. I've just had word from the Tennessee delegation that they are going to fight against one of the planks, as is their privilege under democratic yes, procedure. Course, that's right. Now, what happens uh, when a delegation opposes one particular plank? Well, Just how is that worked out? As a matter of fact, technically, they present the entire platform except the one to which they object and insert the one which is their flank of their choice. And then the question goes before the de delegation as to the substitution of a minority report for the majority report. Well, now, in actuality, it's merely a form of accomplishing an amendment to a report and is handled in about the same way. Oh, yes. So that is not the thing that's going to take a particularly long time. Well, it depends upon the 
heat of the debate and, yes. uh, and how uh, stiff uh, what are the contested. rules on that debate uh, do you have a certain limit on speeches from the floor uh, not a certain limit as to 30 minutes on each speech but no limit as to the number of speeches if this convention wanted to favor mr kelly and his folks they could stay here and talk themselves all next week so far as our rules are concerned i see but they probably won't no one final question the two-thirds rule we understand that some of the southern delegations are trying to reinstate that but we've had no word that there's going to be a fight on that on the floor. Yes. Now, is this delay in the report of that committee, which is rather unusual because that usually comes through fairly promptly, does that have something to do with this two I don't. Rule? I don't relate the one, uh, in this incident, to that the situation at all. I don't think they have any connection. No. Thanks very much. Well, thank you Chairman for uh, calling me to the microphone, Mr. Callenborn. That was Back in the booth now, Jackson, after Chairman, this conversation Chairman. between H.V. Carltonborn of the NBC staff and uh, Senator Sam Jackson, the chairman of the Democratic National Convention. While these two gentlemen have been talking, the orchestra has been playing various tunes, including Dixie. You may have heard it in the background there, and as Dixie's familiar strain sounded out under these cavernous walls and ceiling of the giant auditorium, the Chicago Stadium... Uh, a large part of the uh, delegates stood up, and all of the representatives of the various southern states, Kentucky, North and South Carolina, Florida, Virginia, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, yes, Georgia, of course, and Texas, and even Oklahoma, they all stood up and waved their state banners with the familiar strains of Dixie. Uh, right now, uh, we're in the pause between the proceedings here at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, we have spotted and highlighted the various vantage points where action and excitement and important political developments may uh, take place. Morgan Beatty with a shortwave transmitter is over at the Iowa delegation watching the Vice President Wallace situation. Don Fisher stationed near Missouri's delegation in the event that anything develops on the candidacy of Senator Harry Truman. Right now, California uh, has raised up a great state, state standard. California state banner with the brown bear in the center and the trimmed with scarlet, a fine, handsome silk standard, and they're waving it lustily and happily. While we're this little lull in the proceedings is going on, and the delegates are having a bit of fun and uh, frolic, we're going to pause in our broadcast here from the NBC booth in Chicago Stadium. We'll pause for station identification. This is Chicago WMAQ. The chair recognizes the chairman of this committee to close the debate on the motion now pending, Senator Abe Murdoch. Mr. Chairman, I've driven from one end of the state of Texas to the other. I never drove across that great state that I wasn't impressed with its size, with its resources, and with its possibilities. But I was more impressed on my visits to Texas by the type of manhood and womanhood that you find there. Big as the state of Texas is, it's not big enough to have a division or a contest in Texas democracy. Every man and woman that had anything to say this morning on this controversy said it. The committee was confronted with a bad situation. I thought, and then the committee thought, that if we seated both delegations, and divided the votes between them that nothing could be fairer. I asked the, te the Texas delegation that is sponsoring the amendment to the committee report this. Is it good sportsmanship? Is it consonant and compatible with the great manhood of Texas for them to do anything but accept the committee report, be good soldiers, and good Democrats and go back to Texas United. I think. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the convention, 
Under the rules adopted, I am about to put the question for your decision as to whether or not the amendment shall be agreed to. The force and effect of agreeing to the amendment would be as the delegate who offered the amendment stated to you the seating of the regularly listed delegation with a full vote each. It would amend the report of the committee to the extent that the contesting delegation would not be seated. As many as favor the amendment will signify by saying aye. Those who are opposed will say no. The noes appear to have it, the noes have it, and the amendment is not agreed to. The question is now upon the adoption of the report. The question is upon the adoption of the report of the committee. As many as favor the adoption of the report of the committee will say aye. As many as opposed will say no. The ayes have it, and it is agreed to. The next Back order in the of NBC business, booth, the committee report has been adopted. The amendment the will, has been defeated. In other words, the regulars have been... Uh, the decision has gone against them by the convention at large. There's action plenty down at the Ladies Texas delegation. Some of them the seem to be leaving right the down platform. in the midst of that melee well, as Morgan Beatty and a shortwave order. transmitter. We switch you to the convention floor and to the Everybody Texas delegation. Like. Hello? Is this the booth? Ladies and gentlemen, the convention, the convention will please be in order. Go ahead, Morgan Beatty. Go ahead. You're on the air. The other will join McCormick, Congress. This is Morgan Beatty down on the convention platform, and with me walking out of the convention at this time is Mr. Clint Small, one of the Texas delegates who's been chosen to do that act, and I'd like to ask him what he feels about it. The Texas Democratic Convention has been overruled. Texas democracy has been nullified and set aside by the five acts of the National Convention. Without rhyme or reason, Texas has been deprived of her rights. There is but one thing left to do, and that is to maintain your own self-respect. Thank you very much, Mr. Clint Small, and with that, uh, the majority of the regular Texas delegation has walked out of the convention here in one of the most dramatic acts enacted at any convention in many a year. Now we return you to the booth. The uh, proceedings had been carefully detailed with parliamentary scrupulousness by uh, Chairman Jackson. He explained very carefully to the convention at large what their live voice vote would mean. And they clearly, by a vote of nay over a, defeated the amendment, which would have uh, seated only the anti-Roosevelt Texas delegation. And as Morgan Beatty has just told you in the voice of the Texas delegate himself, some of them have chosen to leave to express their resentment and disapproval of this decision by the convention at large. Right now, a lot of attention in the convention floor is focused on the Texas delegation as they leave uh, with their state banner. Those are the anti-Roosevelt or the regularly seated delegates. Meanwhile, the convention continues with its order of business, and we are switching you now to the platform, to the rostrum, for the report of the Platform and Resolutions Committee. It is in the process of being read by the Honorable John McCormick, Majority Leader of the House of Representatives, the Democratic National Platform. We do not hear detailed scores of planks. We cite action. Part two. Beginning March 1933, the Democratic administration took a series of actions which saved our system of free enterprise. It brought that system out of collapse and thereafter eliminated abuses which had imperiled it. It used the powers of government to provide employment in industry and to save agriculture. It wrote a new Magna Carta for labor. It provided Social Security, including old age pensions, unemployment insurance, security for crippled and dependent children, and the blind. We've returned from the speaker's rostrum to the NBC booth while two amendments are being uh, offered to the convention to the platform which has just been read. 
The platform uh, uh, has been offered by the platform committee for the approval of the delegates, and uh, delegates that uh, voice like vote will occur in just a few moments uh, when these two amendments have been read and digested by the uh, uh, Redmond, digested by the delegates. Meanwhile, alongside me, to keep us abreast of world news and to give us an analysis of the platform's no content, hurry, uh, is Robert St. John. Where did you get a good one? Let's leave the uh, Democratic National Convention in Chicago for a minute and let me tell you about something very, very important. Adolf Hitler made a broadcast to the world tonight just a few hours after an attempt had been made to assassinate him. NBC monitors listened in on that broadcast and they heard Adolf Hitler disclose that German officers were responsible for the plot on his life. Adolf Hitler said, and we quote him, you shall know the details about a crime which is without example in German history. A small clique of ambitious and stupid and criminal officers made a plot to eliminate me and by my death practically to eliminate the staff of the German Wehrmacht. The bomb which was planted by the colonel and then Hitler went on and named the man, Graf von Stupenberg, exploded two meters from my right side. Those are the first details we've had of the assassination attempt. And then Hitler went on to say that he saw in the failure of that attempt to kill him a sign that Providence wanted him, Adolf Hitler, to continue what he called my work. A small group, he said, was ready to stab him in the back as others stabbed Germany in 1918. And then Hitler said that those against him were a small clique who of criminals who now will be ruthlessly eliminated. Hitler said that German soldiers must refuse to obey orders of the usurpers, as he called them, and that German soldiers must arrest the criminals. Well, this is all terribly important because in that radio address, Hitler reveals that there is some sort of trouble inside the German army. And his plea to German soldiers to refuse to obey orders of what he called the usurpers uh, is very significant. It shows that there is revolt flaming inside the German army and that this assassination attempt was just uh, an, an outward sign of something that we hadn't known about. Well, that is the news. Now I return you to Ben Grauer beside me. Uh, Bob, while you've been talking, we've been listening to the proceedings down at the rostrum and uh, a little parliamentary uh, discussion is going on on, on this discussion concerning an international air force resolution offered by the delegate from, uh, from Texas. While it's proceeding, and uh, it'll come to a conclusion in a minute or two, perhaps you'd like to go on and tell us something of what you've culled from the reading of the platform. What do you say, Bob? Yes, Ben, uh, there's some very significant and important things in that platform that uh, even some of the delegates may have overlooked in the rather routine and uh, reading of it in a monotonous voice by the uh, professional reader. The important thing is that, uh, of, of course, is the so-called peace plank. Uh, that is a plank in which the Democratic Party, if it adopts this platform, pledges itself to, if elected, lead America into an association of nations to maintain permanent peace by the use of force of arms, if necessary. Now, that last phrase is important. By the use of force of arms, if necessary. Now, incidentally, the platform is very short. It's only 1,500 words. It's probably the shortest platform that the Democratic Party has ever adopted in all its history. Another very important uh, part of the platform is that which deals with uh, the so-called race question. The platform declares as follows, and I just want to read this uh, short sentence. We believe that racial and religious minorities have the right to live, develop, and vote equally with all citizens and share the rights that are guaranteed by our Constitution. Congress should exert its full constitutional power to protect those rights. Now, that plank probably goes too far for some people. It doesn't go far enough for others. For example, it doesn't go as far as Vice President Wallace went in uh, his uh, seconding speech uh, an hour or so ago. It makes no mention of poll tax, equal education. It isn't specific, but it does say that the Democratic Party believes in racial and religious minorities having an equal right to live, develop, and vote. The platform ignored the pleas of Southern uh, delegates for a states' rights declaration. 
and uh, its plank on the race issue didn't do anything to halt the so-called Southern Revolt. Well, that's uh, a quick summary of the platform. That isn't all, but Ben Grower, I think, wants you back again, so I switch you back to Ben Grower. Uh, fine, Bob. Uh, alongside us, or rather down on the speaker's platform, is H.V. Caltonborn, who heard along with all of us uh, uh, the reading of the platform. I wonder whether you, Mr. Caltonborn, would like to pick out some of the salient features which you detected in it. <clears throat> the platform, of course, is very much shorter than the Republican platform, and that is all to the good. Because the shorter a platform is, the more sincere it is, the more likely it is to have an effect on the campaign and to be frequently quoted by the candidates who are running on that platform. The platform, however, is disappointing in that so much of it is in generalities. It's not very specific. It's not nearly as specific as the Republican platform. For example, I venture to make this assertion that anywhere from two-thirds to three-fourths of it could have been incorporated in a Republican platform and would have been unanimously adopted. In other words, there are in it so very many of those general statements with which everybody agrees. Of course, the platform of the party in power always must differ from the party out of power because the party that is in power recites in its platform the things that it has accomplished and lauds those, whereas the party out of power naturally tries to recite a list of the things that it will do or would do if it should gain power, so that they are essentially different in character. I like particularly the foreign policy plank of the platform. That, to me, is a very direct statement of what most forward-looking people agree should be the foreign policy of the United States. I don't think that it goes farther uh, than it should. As a matter of fact, I think there are a great many Democrats, a great many leaders of the Democrats in the Senate who would go much farther than this plan plank indicates. But it does very definitely provide that we are to join with other United Nations in the establishment of an international organization. And then, if you followed any part of the debate that's now going on, the debate with reference to the creation of an international air force, as Chairman McCormick pointed out, this platform clause requires the creation of adequate forces for the maintenance of peace. They are not to be a separate, independent international force, but a force that will be provided by the nations that are participating in the maintenance of knee, of peace. And in that way, by eliminating the use of that word police force, which caused so much difficulty, they are, in a way, concentrating on the main issue. Together, then, the platform, shorter than the Republican, general in its statements, including much material that everyone would agree with, but very courageous, I believe, on this racial plank that Robert St. John has just commented about. It doesn't specifically mention the poll tax, but it does call for equality. Also, the recommendation with reference to Palestine, that is something that I don't believe was in the Republican platform. Uh, there is a bid to the South in the stress on non-discriminatory transportation charges, and they also declare for the early correction of inequalities. Mr. Wallace also mentioned that in his seconding speech. Then there is, of course, equal rights for women is very definitely stressed, and there is also a clause with reference to free press and radio, a similar clause was included in the Republican platform. The thing that appeals to me is the fact that here is an attempt not to equivocate too much. And while the statements are general, they are at least not carefully balanced. They do not, most of them, equivocate. So on the whole, as platforms go, I should say that it was a good platform. Now back to the NBC booth. We're in the midst of the uh, third session of the Democratic National Convention, 
And going forward at this moment on the speaker's rostrum is a rather involved and highly technical discussion involving the manner of voting on a resolution which has just been presented to the convention, a resolution amending the platform report. The uh, amendment was submitted by Delegate Bradley of Texas and concerns an international air force. And at this very moment, the uh, vote has just been taken by live voice vote under the chairmanship of Sam Jackson, and the resolution has been defeated, and thus far the platform as read originally stands. I am prepared. We are now prepared to call the roll of the states for voting upon the candidate for president of the United States. The clerk will call the roll. Now the official balloting is beginning for the Democratic choice for the office of President of the United States. The clerk is going to call the roll of state for the office of President. Clerk Frazier has taken his place before the microphone. Alabama, 24 votes. Mr. Chairman, Alabama votes... 22 votes for President Roosevelt and two votes for Senator Byrd. Arizona, in votes. Arizona, considered it a great privilege and honor to again cast its 10 votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. You see, when we voted down, we voted for Roosevelt. No, we didn't. Arkansas. Mr. Chairman, Arkansas cast its 20 votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. California, 52 votes. Our 52 votes go to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Colorado, 12 uh, votes. Colorado votes it 12 votes for Arnold Franklin D. Roosevelt. Montana cast 10 votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. Nebraska, 12 votes. Nebraska cast its 12 votes for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Nevada, eight Nevada, votes. Nevada cast its eight votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. New Hampshire, ten uh, votes. New Hampshire cast her ten votes for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. New Jersey, 34 votes. New Jersey? Cast its 34 votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. New Mexico, 10 votes. New Mexico cast its 10 votes for Roosevelt. New York, 96 votes. New York cast one half a vote for Sen Senator Harry F. Byrd. One vote for the Honorable James A. Farley. 94 and one half votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. And with the New York vote, Franklin D. Roosevelt has a majority of this convention. He is the Democratic North nominee Carolina. for President of the United States. 30 votes. North Carolina cast 30 votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. North Dakota, 8 votes. North Dakota, Eight votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. Ohio, 52 votes. Ohio cast 52 votes for President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Oklahoma, 22 votes. Oklahoma cast 22 votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. Oregon, 14 votes. Oregon casts its 14 votes for that matchless leader of leaders, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Pennsylvania, 
72 votes. Pennsylvania is proud and happy to cast its 72 votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. Rhode Island, 10 votes. Rhode Island cast its 10 votes for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. South Carolina, 18 votes. South Carolina cast 14 and one half votes for our distinguished leader, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Three and a half votes for Senator Harry Byrd. 14 and a half for Roosevelt and three and a half for Byrd. South Dakota, eight votes. South Dakota cast eight votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. Tennessee, 26 votes. Tennessee cast 26 votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. Texas, 48 votes. After some considerable effort, I'm happy to cast 24 votes for Franklin Roosevelt. So I understand the vote was 24 for Roosevelt from the Texas delegation. Utah, 10 votes. Utah cast its 10 votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. Are there further votes? Right. Are there further votes to be cast by the state of Texas? Point of inquiry. In the, in the regular delegation, there are 22 delegates present. Are they each allowed one half vote, or does the, twi- does the 22 present cast the full 24 votes allowed to that delegation? The 22 delegates are entitled to cast their 24 votes. Then there are 12 votes for President Roosevelt and 12 votes for Harry Byrd. Clerk will call. Vermont, six votes. Vermont is Vermont is proud to, to cast its six votes for President Roosevelt. Virginia, twenty-four votes. Virginia cast twenty-four votes for Howard Byrd. Washington, 18 votes. Washington cast her 18 votes for our great leader and camp commander-in-chief, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. West Virginia, 18 West, votes. West Virginia cast its 17 votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt and one vote for Harry Bird. West Virginia, 17 votes for Roosevelt, one vote for Byrd. Wisconsin, 26 votes. Wisconsin cast 26 votes for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Wyoming, eight votes. Wyoming, wonderful Wyoming cast eight votes for our president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Alaska, six votes. Alaska cast five votes the river right for now. President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Nobody One vote is lost in the mail, the proxy. Will the Alaska chairman cast that vote again, please? <clears throat> the Alaska, Alaska casts five votes for President Franklin D. Roosevelt. The other vote it will to come by proxy in the mails and has been delayed or lost. I, uh, the chair will state to the delegate that if he's the chairman of the delegation, he's entitled to vote six votes. Therefore, Alaska casts the full six votes for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. District of Columbia, six votes. The District of Columbia cast six votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. Hawaii, 
Six votes. Hawaii casts all of her six votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. Philippine Island, six votes. The Philippine Island, presently possessed by the enemy, but with full confidence in our commander-in-chief to retake and to fly the stars and stripes once again, casts its six votes for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Puerto Rico unanimously cast all its six votes for Franklin D. Roosevelt. Canal Zone, six votes. The, can, the Canal Zone is delighted to cast its six votes for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Virgin Islands, two votes. Mr. Chairman, this is Joseph Alexander speaking for the Virgin Islands delegation, which is happy, proud, and honored to cast its two votes for our Commander-in-Chief and President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. In just a minute, the tally will be presented to the chair and the result of the vote will be announced. While we await the official tally from the chair of this first ballot for President of the United States, which has returned Franklin D. Roosevelt as nominee, following a worldwide news story alongside us is Robert St. John. Let me fill you in on what's been happening elsewhere in the world. The big story outside of Chicago is that attempted assassination by Adolf Hitler and a radio speech which he made about midnight tonight German time which was monitored by our NBC monitors, who heard him say that an attempt had been made by a group of German army officers to prepare Germany for defeat, as in 1918. Hitler took the air to reassure the German public, as he put it, after it had been officially announced that he had been slightly burned and bruised in the explosion of a bomb, while a great many of his highest ranking advisors were gathered about him. Hitler himself told us by radio that 13 members of his own personal military staff were injured, and he disclosed something we didn't know until just a little while ago, that one of those men was fatally injured, was killed. Uh, Hitler said, again, I have evaded faith, which would have brought much misery to the German people. Uh, in the account uh, issued by the Office of War Information on uh, Hitler's speech, uh, he was quoted as well, saying the plan was uh, Texas not Texas. just the work of the German Thank army, inquire, but the work of a small well, clique of criminal well, elements which are now being annihilated uh, without mercy. Uh, Hitler went on to say that it was a sign of providence that he had escaped with such slight injuries. Uh, Hitler said that he saw in this failure to attempt him a sign that providence wanted him to continue his work. And here, while we're waiting for the results of the tally down on the platform here in the convention hall in Chicago, are a few other highlights of the news that's been happening around the world today. On the western front, the British drive uh, has gone eight miles beyond the Normandy city of Caen. Americans have captured three villages south of the uh, French city of saint Lô. In Russia, the Soviet army has driven eight miles beyond the pre-war East Prussian frontier. The uh, Soviet army has outflanked the Polish city of Lwów and has driven to the edge of the Bug River in a new offensive. In Italy, Allied troops are right now tonight pressing beyond the city of Leghorn toward Florence. In the air war, nearly 3,000 American warplanes today smashed at 15 targets in Germany with 4,000 tons of bombs. Way off in China, the armies of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek in the central Hunan province have moved to relieve the besieged city of Hengyang. Off in southeastern Asia, the Japanese to continue to retreat along a 700-mile front uh, in Burma. And now, uh, back to Ben Grower. 
While you've been talking, we've been listening to the proceedings on the speaker's roster, well, and there uh, has been some difficulty in tabulating the accurately the vote of the Texas delegation, inasmuch as the two, dele two delegations had been seated and uh, the, the uh, accurate distribution of the votes between Byrd and Roosevelt are being worked out now. And so the official tabulation will have to wait for some time. But this point is incontrovertible, that uh, some overwhelming majority of votes, an overwhelming majority was for Franklin D. Roosevelt, and he has clearly returned the nominee on the first ballot. This concludes, then, the broadcasting of this second-day session of the Democratic National Convention, a long and storm toss session which has seen the adoption of the Democratic platform and the nomination of Franklin Delano Roosevelt as president, a Democratic nominee for President of the United States. The National Broadcasting Company will return to the air from the convention at 9 p.m. Central Wartime at 10 p.m. Eastern Wartime tonight with a session which will be highlighted by the acceptance speech of the Democratic nominee, Mr. Roosevelt, and the selection of the Democratic vice presidential candidate by the party. That is the one of the real contests of this convention and a focal point of interest. If the vice president can be nominated tonight, and that is the aim of the convention, this will be the shortest convention of any major party in some 50 years. And here now is uh, an approximately final tabulation. Uh, 1,086 for Roosevelt, 89 for Byrd, one vote for Farley. That awaits final official confirmation. But the, here it will go down to the platform for the official tabulation at this precise minute. 1,086 for Roosevelt. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen. It had been given by the clerk, but not it was withheld. 1,086 for Roosevelt, 89 for Byrd, and one for Farley. And that concludes our broadcasting at this time. NBC returns to the air tonight with its full staff of commentators. Meanwhile, that's all from the Chicago Stadium. The program's backstage wife, Stella Dallas, Lorenzo Jones, young Witter Brown, when a girl marries, we love and learn, just plain Bill, front page Farrell, Lowell Thomas and the News, the Chesterfield Song Shop, Dr. Kate, Alka-Seltzer News of the World, Charlie Chan, and H.V. Kaltenborn edits the news, usually heard over most of these stations on Thursday, were not presented tonight in order that we might bring you the special broadcast from the Democratic National Convention. They will be heard at their usual times tomorrow and next week. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> This is Chicago WMAQ. The programs Alex Dreyer and the News, the Walgreens Newscast, Don Elder Sports News, Hub Jackson's News, Jimmy Blade and His Music, and Supper Interlude, usually heard over WMAQ on Thursday, were not presented tonight in order that we might bring you the special program just concluded. They will be heard at their regular times tomorrow. An animated and thrilling scene. Uh, the usual bunting and flags around the edges of the mezzanines and balcony have been draped with flag. Little V signs for victory illuminating a little neon red, white, and blue signs. And here and there interspersed on the balconies are the shields of the various states. The only other uh, signs in the building or in the stadium is uh, one strip of photographs and replicas of the visages of some dozen uh, presidents, Democratic presidents, says the sign, and their names running from Jefferson chronologically up to Roosevelt. One more feature which we should mention here in this flag draped convention hall of the Chicago Stadium is a giant cutout picture of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the northwest corner there. In serene countenance, he surveys the scene where his name was placed the nomination and selected. And now, the Reverend Harrison Anderson of the Fourth Presbyterian Church will shortly deliver the invocation as we, con we continue this session of the uh, Democratic National Convention. Uh, the uh, usual procedure is... Let us pray. Invocation to go on... Eternal the, God, uh, our Heavenly Father, and here we stand is before the, Thee uh, to acknowledge Thee as, as the time. Lord. Is uh, in our well, I thought for a moment that we would, we would have an announcement of importance the Lord that has come the house, at, uh, at this precise moment. They minute. labor in vain that build it. We would also remember that there is only one foundation. As we told you, seated alongside us is uh, one of NBC's staff of correspondents who sat with us today as we watched the tumultuous session which marked the acceptance of the platform and the uh, uh, choosing of Franklin D. Roosevelt as the party's nominee. Uh, Robert St. John's been sitting alongside us throughout the day and uh, gathering himself a sheaf of news bulletins. Uh, Bob, have you some comments at this time? I have a little uh, material from abroad, uh, Ben, I'd like to tell our listeners about. Uh, 
Off in uh, Germany tonight, Adolf Hitler has just announced that the group of German army officers who attempted to assassinate him uh, have either committed suicide or have been executed. But anyway, Hitler claims that that conspiracy has been nipped in the bud by what he called speedy, ruthless action. There are no more details about where the attempted assassination took place or uh, just who the uh, men were that attempted to kill Hitler. All we know is that the one name Hitler gave us was Colonel Count von Stroffenberg. Just who he is, we don't know. I uh, return you now to Ben Grauer. The uh, speakers who are on our program tonight are familiar to many radio listeners. Helen Gahagan Douglas, the wife of Melvin Douglas, is noted as an actress and as a young California woman deeply interested in public affairs. Melvin Douglas, a film actor, is now an army captain in the China-Burma-India theater. And uh, Mrs. Douglas, as Helen Gahagan, became interested in social reform... He says in 1932, when the youth of the nation started migrating to California in search of jobs. A deep interest ever since in the social reforms of the Roosevelt administration, Mrs. Douglas has said, has made her conscious of politics, but she disavowed being a politician. Well, there is no disputing the fact that she has great presence and great personal charm, and uh, our audience here, I know, is looking forward to hearing and seeing her when she gives her address. Quentin Reynolds, of course, is the world-famous uh, international correspondent who has recently returned from visits to the fighting front. Uh, Quent is, uh, as he's known affectionately by his intimates, is a strong, uh, well-built fellow with a large, ready smile and a warm personality and a free and easy way of speaking which we feel will endear him to his audience here. And now, in just a moment, ladies and gentlemen... We are going to have the singing of the national anthem. The singer who will perform for our audience here at the convention is Danny O'Neill. He's just stepped to the front of the platform, and he is being received by the audience. We'll have the national anthem sung by for Danny O'Neill. The national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn? early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous night o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallant delegates who came late will now find their places, and those who are visitors and guests who are in the aisle will please clear the aisle so that the delegates may find their places. Let us have the center aisle cleared, please, the sergeant at arms. Let's ask the delegates to move in quickly.
Ladies and gentlemen, the next session of Congress will be graced with the presence of a young woman, the wife of an army captain, who is now serving in the field of combat. She is a good Democrat, a good liberal, and an able leader who has gone from one brilliant career, the stage and screen, into another, the field of politics, where we all know her name will shine as brightly. I have pleasure in presenting to you Helen Cahagan Douglas, a very lovely lady. platform to the speaker's rostrum where she's joined by Chairman Sam Jackson and they're posing for the photographer. We the people want no bread lines as a result of the peace we all long for. We want the man whose every act over 12 years shows that he hates and loathes bread lines with every fiber of his being. We want the man who has taken more concentrated abuse from the few than any other man in American history because he has refused to consign any part of the American people to poverty. Here tonight, we are keenly aware of our men and women on the battlefront all over this world. We have in our hearts the deepest gratitude for their sacrifices. We are of stern determination to give each and every one of them not just lip service, but full opportunity for rehabilitation, education, for jobs, for advancement in a full and happy life. We each see our own. You and I, the one we love best in relation to this war. There is scarcely a home across the length and breadth of this country that hasn't been touched by it. But you belittle your son, your daughter, your husband, and I belittle my husband and we imperil our children unless we see our dear ones now serving overseas in relation to their country, their world, their future. It is with this future in mind that this convention has made its choice. We know that this country, mindful of the quickening pulse of social change the world over, will choose a president who will lead us to a fuller and richer life. We know this because we are the party of the people. interests apart from the interests of the American people. It has no interests apart from the interests of the American soldiers, the millions of American workers and farmers, of American businessmen. 
There is no conflict between what the Democratic Party wants and what the majority of the people of America want, for they want the same. Helen Gehagen Douglas has just concluded an address to the Democratic National Convention now in session in Chicago. And very warmly, enthusiastically, it is being received right now by the convention members. Everyone has stood up in his place or place, and incidentally, we can say in passing, we said some of the seats were empty, but uh, they aren't now. The entire stadium is jammed to the door. Every delegate and alternate is in place, and every one of the seats is taken. In fact, there's an overflow crowd that is jamming the ramps and entrances. There must be some oh, 500 or 1,000 people. Ladies and gentlemen, Here is and Chairman and Jackson. I see the aisles are crowded now in this demonstration. I'm going to ask you to please be seated. There's time and room. Let's have the aisles cleared. Can we have the center aisle cleared, please? Now, during this next address, I hope you will make yourselves comfortable. You will want to hear, and you certainly can't hear comfortably milling up and down the aisle. There are seats for delegates. Please take your seats, and those who are visitors in the aisles, will you please... Uh, Make way so that the delegates can find their places and be seated. I want to make a suggestion to the delegates and to the visitors. We were listening on the radio, and the audible conversation is not particularly helpful. Ladies and gentlemen, back from the field of combat, where he faced the enemy fire as an observer and participant in the opening of the Western Front, has come one of America's best-known and best-liked writers. We shall hear tonight what the boys over there think about, not as hearsay, but as seen and heard and felt at first hand by one who went side by side with our soldiers into battle. Ladies and gentlemen, I take great pleasure in introducing to you Quentin Reynolds. Impressive figure of Quentin Reynolds leaves the speaker's platform and comes right out there on the speaker's roster. Quentin Reynolds, tall, erect, broad-shouldered, curly brown hair, in a dark blue suit, easy of manner, smiling of countenance, broad, happy grin on his face. Hello, he says to a lot of the newsboys and photographers, many of whom he's known specially in daily contact and working in news coverage and overseas, too. Hello, he smiles and bows to them. He stands there in a pool of brilliant white light from the Kleegs above. Quentin Reynolds on the speaker's rostrum of the Democratic National Convention. many things to us as a people. For one thing, it has changed millions of us who used to be mere spectators into participants. Millions of us who once went meekly to the polls on election day or who didn't bother to go at all, now for the first time have become conscious of the fact that we have no right to sit by idly 
and allow professional politicians to do our thinking for us. We have no right to be mere spectators in any affair which concerns the welfare of our country. Doing everything in his power to avert the catastrophe, as far back as 1937, in this very city of Chicago, this man said, war is a contagion whether it be declared or undeclared. It can engulf states and peoples remote from the original scene of hostilities. We are determined to keep out of war, yet we cannot insure ourselves against the disastrous effects of war. We could no more escape this war than King Canute could hold back the tides. We could no more escape this war than we could hold back the winds of a hurricane or stop the earth from rotating around the sun. But millions of our countrymen didn't realize this until December 7, 1941, when that other comfortable world we knew came to an end. And then the Japanese told us in no uncertain terms that this was our war too. They convinced millions of Americans who until then had been using the old ostrich defense of sticking their heads in the sand and hearing nothing, seeing nothing, feeling nothing. They forgot that when you use the ostrich defense, you leave part of yourself in a mighty vulnerable position and the obvious thing is apt to happen. By now, your sons know that this is no foreign war. They know it each night, back of the lines, when they listen to the German radio. Incidentally, they listen to Radio Berlin assiduously. The good Dr. Goebbels gives them half an hour of American swing music each night and ten minutes of propaganda. They love the music and get a laugh out of the propaganda. The propaganda is frankly and bluntly aimed at our democracy, at our way of living. And if any of them ever had any doubts as to what they were fighting for, the good Dr. Goebbels, by his propaganda, has taught them what they are fighting against. They learned that this was no foreign war when they first went to England. They saw the shrines of England in ruins. They saw the scars on the House of Commons, and they saw the precious stained glass windows of Westminster Abbey lying broken in the dust. The House of Commons has always been the symbol of free speech in Britain. This indeed was a logical target for Hitler's bombs. Westminster Abbey has always been a symbol of the Christian way of life in Britain. This, too, was a logical target for Hitler's bombs. Your sons knew then that Hitler was waging war not against any one country, but against our ideals and our way of life. No matter where they were found, whether it be Prague or Oslo or London or Chicago, your sons learned that this was no foreign war when they captured their first prisoners in northern Africa and heard arrogant, contemptuous voices sneering at our democracy. They knew it was no foreign war when they saw the bestiality of the Hermann Goering division in Sicily, a division which even booby-trapped its own dead. Then they entered the cities and towns of Sicily and Italy. And they saw the incredible ravages the Germans had been guilty of. When they heard the stories of those who had survived, these grim-faced, tight-lipped sons of yours knew then that this was their war and ours. Yes, your sons know what they're fighting for. Even if 
some of us at home are sometimes a little bit confused. On the way into the Bay of Salerno last September, I was on a ship that had just one chaplain. 3 a.m. was to be H hour at Salerno. We steamed through the Mediterranean, one of a thousand unseen ships, in the quiet and darkness of the night, pressed down upon us all. I passed the chaplain's cabin. He had a sign on his door which merely said, open all night. And there was a line of 40 men waiting to talk to him. I went on deck and sat with a group of assault troops. They were quiet now, each in his own way trying to overcome his fear. All soldiers are afraid just before combat. They're afraid of the waiting. They're afraid of being afraid at the crucial moment. They're afraid of the nameless unseen ghosts that walk through the halls of the night. They're always all right once they swing ashore with their guns in their hands and their grenades at their belts. But it's always bad just before that. You men who were in the last war know you always suffered more during that period of waiting before zero hour than when you were actually going over the top. It was like that approaching Solano. The boys got to talking. One of them joined us and said he'd just been in to see the chaplain. A nice fellow, the padre, the boy said. You know, I talked to him and got some things off my mind, and he was pretty swell to me. And you know, he never asked me what church I belonged to. One of the other fellows chimed in and said he'd had the same experience with the chaplain. Then the boys squatting there in the quiet of the deck, surrounded by their guns and tin hats and ammunition and rations, started talking about why we were fighting and what we were fighting for. They all knew what we were fighting against, but they weren't very articulate in putting into words just what we were fighting for until a big corporal from Texas, a member of the 36th Division, said quietly, I'll tell you what we're fighting for. We're fighting for things like what happened tonight with the chaplain. Half the ship went in to see him because we were scared. He didn't do any preaching about patriotism or hellfire. He just soothed us, kind of, and let us talk about home to him. And then we left feeling better, yeah. And he never asked any of us what our religion was. Did that happen anywhere but in our country? No, and that's what we're fighting to keep. And we're fighting for another thing, too. We're fighting for the right to ball out the umpire. He went on, he said, I mean, when I go home, if I get a job and I don't like the boss, I can quit and get another job. If I think the boss is calling the plays wrong, I can just leave. If I go to a movie and I don't like it, why, I can leave and shop around until I find the kind of movie I do like. Nobody's going to be telling me what kind of movie I got to see, like it is in Germany. And if I don't like what one newspaper says, if I don't like the way it calls the play, well, that newspaper fellow is the umpire, and I can ball them out and find myself a paper I do like. Nobody's going to tell me what paper I got to read. And when I turn on the radio... It isn't like in Germany where there's only one station and you got to listen to it because the government controls it and you hear nothing on it but propaganda. If I don't like what I hear on the radio, I can make with a twist of the wrist and get another station. Sure, that's what we're fighting for, he said. And add it all up together. And it means we're fighting for the right to ball out the umpire. Believe me, your sons and the sons of your neighbors know what they're fighting for. And they're doing a lot of thinking over there on both sides of the world. They're thinking of the world they're coming back to one day. But they also know one other thing. They know that this mighty achievement, which 
dwarfs any other in the whole history of our country, was all accomplished under the leadership of their commander-in-chief and ours, Franklin D. Roosevelt. by the noted war and foreign correspondent, Quentin Reynolds. The banners are flying and state standards are being waved. In fact, off in the distance, you probably can hear the sound of a siren uh, sounded by some enthusiastic uh, convention visitor. While we've been talking, while Quentin Reynolds has been talking, a significant bulletin has just come in on our newsprinters here in the NBC booth, which, following the attempt on Adolf Hitler's life today, takes on added meaning. It comes by a burn Switzerland. Skirmishes took place in various parts of Germany today between Nazi party members led by SS troopers and groups of the regular army, according to unconfirmed reports reaching here tonight. Conferences of the Nazi party organization were held in all principal cities of the Reich this evening. Members were asked to reaffirm their loyalty to the party and to Adolf Hitler, according, this is, to reliable information in this bulletin via Bern, Switzerland. This, coupled with the news we've had of the attempt on Hitler's life, gives indication, to some extent anyway, of a revolt against Hitler's leadership and a possible crumbling of the Nazi high command. Now back to our domestic scene here at the Democratic National Convention. As we've told you, this is absolutely a capacity night here in the Chicago Stadium. We witnessed the Republican National Convention some three weeks ago, and this one, and in all the two sessions of this and the four sessions of the other, we never saw the stadium so jam-packed to the very walls. The aisles are utterly filled, and so are the entrances and the ramps to the various levels of the mezzanines and balconies. And now we take you to the speaker's rostrum as the organ plays a tune in salute to the nation's chief executive. The band is playing Hail to the Chief as we await the words of Chairman Sam Jackson of Indiana, which will take us to the undisclosed place from which the nation's chief executive will make his speech of acceptance. Chairman Jackson is facing the audience now at the speaker's rostrum, and we switch you down there at this moment. Ladies and gentlemen of the convention, may we have as much quiet as possible. Since the following talk will come to you by radio, may I not only suggest to you, but urge that you remember that you should refrain from any applause or demonstration during this talk. Please hold your applause and your accompanying enthusiasm until the speech is finished. Ladies and gentlemen of the convention, the President of the United States. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the convention, my friends, I have already indicated to you why I accept the nomination that you have offered me, in spite of my desire to retire to the quiet of private life. You in this convention are aware of what I have sought to gain for the nation, and you have asked me to continue. It seems wholly likely that within the next four years, our armed forces and those of our allies will have gained a complete victory over Germany and Japan sooner or later, and that the world once more will be at peace under a system, we hope, that will prevent a new world war. In any event, Whenever that time comes, new hands will then have full opportunity to realize the ideals which we seek. In the last three elections, the people of the United States have transcended party affiliation. Not only Democrats, but also forward-looking Republicans and millions of independent voters have turned to progressive leadership, a leadership which has sought consistently and with fair success to advance the...
average American citizen who had been so forgotten during the period after the last war. I am confident that they will continue to look to that same kind of liberalism to build our safer economy for the future. I am sure that you will understand me when I say that my decision expressed to you formally tonight is based solely on a sense of obligation to serve if called upon to do so by the people of the United States. I shall not campaign in the usual sense for the office. In these days of tragic sorrow, I do not consider it fitting. And besides, in these days of global warfare, I shall not be able to find the time. I shall, however, feel free to report to the people the facts about matters of concern to them, and especially to correct any misrepresentations. During the past few days, I have been coming across the whole width of the continent to a naval base where I am speaking to you now from the train. As I was crossing the fertile lands and the wide plains and the Great Divide, I could not fail to think of the new relationship between the people of our farms and cities and villages and the people of the rest of the world overseas, on the islands of the Pacific, in the Far East, in the other Americas, in Britain, and Normandy, and Germany, and Poland, and Russia itself. For Oklahoma and California, for example, are becoming a part of all these distant spots, as greatly as Massachusetts and Virginia were a part of the European picture in 1778. Today, Oklahoma and California are being defended in Normandy and on Saipan, and they must be defended there, for what happens in Normandy and Saipan vitally affects the security and the well-being of every human being in Oklahoma and California. Mankind changes the scope and the breadth of its thought and vision slowly indeed. In the days of the Roman Empire, eyes were focused on Europe, on the Mediterranean area. The civilization in the Far East was barely known of. The American continents were unheard of. And even after the people of Europe began to spill over to other continents, the people of North America in colonial days knew only their Atlantic seaboard and a tiny portion of the other Americas, and they turned mostly for trade and international relationship to Europe. Africa at that time was considered only as the provider of human chattels. Asia was essentially unknown to our ancestors. During the 19th century, during that era of development and expansion on this continent, we felt a natural isolation, geographic, economic, and political an isolation from the vast world which lay overseas. Not until this generation, roughly this century, have people here and elsewhere been compelled more and more to widen the orbit of their vision to include every part of the world. Yes, it has been a wrench, perhaps, but a very necessary one. It is good that we are all getting that broader vision, for we shall need it after the war. The isolationists and the ostriches who plagued our thinking before Pearl Harbor are becoming slowly extinct. 
The American people now know that all nations of the world, large and small, will have to play their appropriate part in keeping the peace by force and in deciding peacefully the disputes which might lead to war. We all know how truly the world has become one, that if Germany and Japan, for example, were to come through this war with their philosophies established and their armies intact, our own grandchildren would again have to be fighting in their day for their liberties and their lives. Someday soon, we shall all be able to fly to any other part of the world within 24 hours. Oceans will no longer figure as greatly in our physical defense as they have in the past. For our own safety and for our own economic good, therefore, if for no other reason, we must take a leading part in the maintenance of peace and in the increase of trade among all the nations of the world. And that is why your government, for many, many months, has been laying plans and studying the problems of the near future preparing itself to act so that the people of the United States may not suffer hardships after the war, may continue constantly to improve its standards, and may join with other nations in doing the same. There are even now working towards that end the best staff in all our history, men and women of all parties, and from every part of the nation. I realize that planning is a word which in some places brings forth sneers. But, for example, before our entry into the war, it was planning which made possible the magnificent organization and the equipment of the Army and Navy of the United States, which are fighting for us and for our civilization today. Improvement through planning is of necessity the order of the day. Even in military affairs, things do not stand still. An army or a navy, trained and equipped and fighting according to a 1932 model, would not have been a safe reliance in 1944. And if we are to progress in our civilization, improvement is necessary in other fields, in the physical things that are a part of our daily lives, and also in the concepts of social justice at home and abroad. I am now at this naval base in the performance of my duties under the Constitution. The war waits for no elections. Decisions must be made. Plans must be laid. Strategy must be carried out. They do not concern merely a party or a group. They will affect the daily lives of Americans for generations to come. What is the job before us in 1944? First, to win the war. To win the war fast and to win it overpoweringly. Second, to form worldwide international organizations and to arrange to use the armed force of the sovereign nations of the world to make another war impossible within the foreseeable future. And third, to build an economy for our returning veterans and for all Americans, which will provide employment and provide decent standards of living. The people of the United States will decide this fall 
whether they wish to turn over this 1944 job, this worldwide job, to inexperienced or immature hands, to those who opposed land lease and international cooperation against the forces of aggression and tyranny, until they could read the poles of popular sentiment, or whether they wish to leave it to those who saw the danger from abroad. Possible to dig out of this mass and uh, conglomeration of humanity down there on the convention floor, whether in that Iowa delegation, uh, Henry Wallace is seated at this moment. Utah uh, is to try to decide whether to leave their delegation and to walk out into the parade. The parade continues and seems to increase. It certainly isn't losing any of its enthusiasm. Now, here'll be a rather vital uh, decisive point whether uh, Chairman Jackson will cross the Rubicon of convention of fire and carry on or whether he'll subside and let the uh, parade build. Uh, the organ has stopped for a moment. That gives them rhythm and pace, gives the uh, delegates, gives the... Uh, uh, paraders a chance to get organized and in step. And there's a band has started up above. The band has taken over. That's the official uh, convention band taken over from the organ, which is on the perch just below. And the paraders welcome this addition to the rhythm and spirit of the occasion. While we've been talking to you, an NBC crew with Don Fisher as observer and a shortwave transmitter are somewhere in this melee of of dancing happy people exultant in their little parade that they're starting here on the convention floor. We'll call you in, Don Fisher, wherever you are and hear us. Come in, Don Fisher, on the shortwave transmitter. Thank you, sir. Yes, as you said, I am somewhere down on the floor. I'm really not sure myself. I've been in crowded places before, but nothing to compare with the one I'm in right now. I thought this afternoon's parade represented a crowd of people marching around the floor of Chicago Stadium, but I'm telling you, it doesn't compare with tonight's. I just said to Morgan Beatty a few moments ago they certainly wouldn't attempt a parade tonight with all this crowd because I'm telling you there are people standing in every square foot of the floor of Chicago Stadium tonight and that is no fooling. Nevertheless, we've been jammed over to one side while the parade passes by. And would you believe it, second or third in line in this Wallace parade was Senator Pepper of Florida having more fun than anybody else near him. I'm telling you, he had a smile on his face from ear to ear. As Ben Grower has told you, almost every Wallace supporter here in Chicago Stadium has a Wallace sign in his hand. Signs reading, win with Wallace, Roosevelt and Wallace, don't break up the winning team. Roosevelt wants Wallace, and people want Wallace, and signs of that nature. Tonight we saw for the first time signs with Fred Truman for vice president. That was something new. We hadn't seen them until tonight. No doubt you can hear the parade passing by. The merrymakers, as they go past our microphone, shout things like, Tell them I was for Wallace, and things like that. I'm telling you, it is a mob scene. Morgan, have you got anything to add to what I've already said? Well, they've even added the final touch of a couple of stilettos. They're really nail files and a Truman sign that I see here. That's about as much as I can say at the moment, Don. Thank you. Okay. How about you, Dick Harkness? Well, the amazing thing that people who are lawyers and merchants and perfectly sane, sensible people back home will come to a national political convention and put on a show and a kind of parade that they're putting on this evening. They really go sort of stark, raving mad. They're a little bit delirious. However, I do think that it's the real old American tradition of American politics. It's democracy with a small d and the very system we're fighting for. Thank you, Don. Okay, and I want to say, too, that while we were down here, we tried to sense the opinion of many of the onlookers as to how these speeches tonight were received. The speeches of Helen Gahagan Douglas, Quentin Reynolds, and, the, of course, the President of the United States. Everyone here seems to think that they were extremely well received. In fact, there seems to be a great deal of unity behind the nomination of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Well, that's just about all from the floor now. I take you back to Ben Brower in the booth. Well, uh, colleagues and confreres, I won't embarrass you again by asking you where you are. We still haven't picked you out in this swirling mass of humanity on the convention floor, and we can well understand from your description and from what we see that it's pretty difficult to get your bearings in the parade that's swirling down the floor. 
You've been listening to Don Fisher, Morgan Beatty, and Richard Harkness, uh, three NBC commentators whom we had thought were in three different places but are probably huddling together for self-protection in the unbounding enthusiasm of this demonstration which has sprung up here at the uh, Chicago Stadium. We spoke a while ago of the Truman for Vice President banners. Uh, most of them, in fact, as far as I can see, all of them are now re- confined to one section to the Missouri delegation, the home state of Senator Truman. Uh, maybe one or two of them have leaked into the parade. No, they haven't, as far as I can see. It's strictly a Roosevelt and Wallace parade. We want Wallace, Roosevelt and Wallace, the winning team, Roosevelt and Wallace. The enthusiasm continues unabated. In fact, somewhat, if I may essay a, a guess, increased. Uh, the band has piped up another tune, and uh, the parade goes on and on, passing down the uh, down the uh, one side of the aisle and around towards the other. Right now, uh, seated alongside me is Bob St. John. Bob, you've been watching this along with me. I uh, uh, wonder what your comment is. Well, thank you, Ben. What this apparently is all about is an attempt on the part of the delegates themselves to force a, uh, a decision tonight on this vice presidential matter. The uh, plan has been changed several times today, but the latest plan was to adjourn uh, rather soon now and uh, put uh, the candidates for the vice president in nomination tomorrow and do the voting uh, tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon. But the Wallace crowd seem to think that uh, they have it sort of in the bag now, and... I think that the whole point of this big demonstration right at this moment is to stay here uh, until dawn if necessary and get it over with because apparently the Wallace people think they have the votes now. The last claim I saw was around 400. That isn't enough to nominate, but it's a great deal more than anyone else's claim. The, uh, uh, the chances on this uh, vice presidential uh, uh, contest of waver back and forth, uh, but uh, it looks now uh, as if Wallace has the majority of strength. Now, back to Ben Grower. Commenting on the fact that this demonstration, thoroughly spontaneous and unrehearsed, has been going on now by the clock about 15 Ladies minutes or more. Uh uh-uh, uh, Chairman Jackson is gaveling for order. He got out, ladies and gentlemen, and he was going to go ahead and a roar of disapproval that is of of kindly negation came up from the crowd and he doesn't seem to be able to go on. He turned away with a half wry, half happy smile and said to, uh, I think it was Frank Haig who's right near him on the speaker's rostrum, shook his head as though to indicate can't handle it or can't do it or they won't listen to it. Now he's holding up his hand and pointing at his wristwatch. And if that isn't enough, he's pointing to one of the great big Ladies and gentlemen of the convention. The use for athletic events here. Ladies and gentlemen of the convention says... Chairman Sam Jackson of Indiana, an expert parliamentarian and an old and expert hand at handling big audiences, but he isn't prevailing, he isn't prevailing, and now he's conferring with another of his aides and colleagues as to what decision to make, whether to carry on, whether to reset, and what to do with this demonstration here. Everyone's uh, focused on the roster. Ladies and gentlemen, and here we'll take a chance to go down to Sam Jackson and see how he succeeds in quelling this, We're going to have this to demonstration. Stop sometime. Sam Jackson. Ladies and gentlemen, may we have your attention? Gentlemen, will you please give your attention? Send somebody up here. Send someone up here.
Ladies and gentlemen of the convention, this is getting serious now. People may be in, in serious difficulty. Convention, we are packed in these aisles until it may become dangerous. Now, this has been a great day for the party, a great day for the country. Tomorrow will be another great day. And I recognize a Delegate David Lawrence from the uh, state of Pennsylvania for the purpose of making an appropriate motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that this fourth session of the Democratic National Convention recess until tomorrow, July 20th. indiscriminate roar from the crowd. All those against, no. The ayes have it, says Chairman Sam Jackson of Indiana, pounds the gavel once decisively and strides off the rostrum. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen. The convention has been Ladies and gentlemen, be very Sam easy Jackson in again. these aisles. People are being injured here tonight, and we're not in that big a hurry. Now take it easy. Take the rest of the night to get out if you have to. So tomorrow... Aminum ruffled, despite the extremely exciting and uh, uh, unexpected turn of events here at the Chicago Stadium, Sam Jackson leaves the platform again, and I think this time he really, really means it. And so we have concluded a tumultuous session, the fourth session of the Democratic National Convention at the Chicago Stadium, which witnessed the addresses of Helen Gagan Douglas, uh, uh, Quentin Reynolds, and the President of the United States. While all this has been going on, some uh, 15 to 20 minutes of this demonstration in behalf of uh, the candidacy of Vice President Wallace, H.B. Kaltenborn has been sitting as a calm island of security in the midst of all this turmoil. H.B., uh, how does it strike you? Tomorrow morning. Stand by. <coughs> Go ahead, Mr. Kaltenborn. I probably can't hear my cue over the uh, turmoil and excitement here in the auditorium. So I'll call you again, H.B. Carlton Bourne. If you can hear me, will you nod your head and, and go ahead? Yes, uh, I can hear you now. I was listening for the moment to what the uh, chairman was saying. He was repeating the announcement that the convention was adjourned. This has been one of the most dramatic sessions that we have had. Dramatic for the quality of the speeches and dramatic, of course, because of this conclusion where we had a spontaneous demonstration such as we haven't seen since the convention began. The Wallace forces had evidently organized themselves very carefully and were determined to force this thing to a vote tonight. It seems that they feel that they have a much better chance of carrying the day tonight than they may have tomorrow morning. And so, when they saw the chairman approach the platform with the idea of calling for the motion of adjournment, they resisted, and as you have heard, for nearly half an hour, they've been carrying on this demonstration. As I was watching it, I sensed its spontaneous character. It's perfectly evident that the friends that Mr. Wallace has in this convention are very sincere and vigorously devoted friends. And they were certainly going to make the most of whatever opportunity the chairman might give them to demonstrate the fact that they want Wallace and that they wanted to have him tonight. And counting up the banners, I was surprised that the Truman forces, who are, after all, very strong and who have a good many states that are going to vote for Senator Truman, that they were so poorly represented as far as banners are concerned. It shows that when it comes to a demonstration, you've got to be prepared if you're going to make a good showing. According to what we saw from the platform here tonight, why, it was all Wallace. And if we were to permit ourselves to be swayed, by this particularly emotional demonstration, we'd say why it's all up with Truman and it's going to be Wallace. But I'm not at all sure 
that demonstrations, even as enthusiastic as the one we have tonight, are a definite criterion as to the way the votes are going, particularly since they are now going to be counted in the sober light of tomorrow's day. The speeches today, as I said a moment ago, were unusually impressive. I felt that three of them were outstanding. The address of Vice President Wallace, which was very well delivered, in a very fine temper and spirit, with a good deal of a sense of humor, and very effectively presented. I think you couldn't help liking the man that made that particular speech. You recognized his sincerity, his honesty, his force, and his willingness to say things that were unpopular, because several of the things that he did say were decidedly unpopular with a good part of his audience. The president's speech, too, in its fine, broad outlook on America's relation to world affairs was a notable contribution to the present thought of the country. The convention has not yet been recessed. I believe Mrs. Bredenberg is on the speaker stand there making a few last-minute uh, uh, statements about uh, where the committees can meet and what can go on in this room and in that room, various resolutions being offered and various little statements made from the floor of the House, or rather from the floor of the convention here. The delegates are all, uh, many, many of the delegates are still on the floor, but many of them are now trickling out of the exits here. Well, a lot of little notes around here. This afternoon we saw a man selling fans here at the stadium, but tonight the fans were not in evidence, apparently. As a matter of fact, there are very few people with these fans we noticed here on the convention. Uh, some of them were fanning themselves with Panama hats and with handkerchiefs and with papers, but very few with these very fancy little fans that the gentleman around here was selling this afternoon. Uh, as a matter of fact, most of the delegates here at the convention tonight had their coats on. It wasn't apparently too warm down there, except during that demonstration when uh, Governor Kerr in the keynote address uh, said that uh, we will support our commander-in-chief, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Incidentally, we clocked that demonstration that lasted almost ten minutes. You know, one of the most uh, uh, impressive sights that we saw here at the Chicago Stadium tonight was during the Star Spangled Banner rendition by Phil Regan. There are great, big, huge spotlights here at the stadium shining down on the speaker's platform and directly in front of us. When Phil Regan came there to sing the Star Spangled Banner tonight, every light in the stadium went out except these huge spotlights directly across from us, Phil standing there in this white glow of light, all the rest of the lights out, and nothing but the little red, white, and blue V's for victory all around the stadium. The V for victory signs are very, very nice little touch here in the stadium. They are still glowing, as a matter of fact, at this time. And now, it is the pleasure of the Blue Network to bring you a broadcast with the Vice President of the United States, Henry A. Wallace. This is a scoop broadcast, an exclusive feature. Martin Nagronsky, Blue Network commentator, has taken Mr. Wallace from the floor of the convention to a special Blue Network studio here in the stadium, and will present him to you now. Go ahead, Martin Nagronsky. This is Martin Agronsky speaking to you from the Blue Network Studios in the Chicago Stadium. I have just come up here from the convention floor at the conclusion of this evening's session, and it is my privilege to be accompanied by Henry A. Wallace, the Vice President of the United States. You heard just a couple of hours ago the tremendous demonstration that greeted Mr. Wallace's appearance here at the Democratic Convention this evening. For nearly 15 minutes, the delegates and spectators assembled here gave Mr. Wallace a thunderous ovation. This afternoon, Mr. Wallace became an avowed candidate for renomination as Vice President of the United States. You have undoubtedly heard the Vice President's emphatic statement of his intention to fight to the finish for that renomination. It is now my privilege to present to you the Vice President of the United States, Mr. Henry A. I had hoped this evening uh, quietly to join my old friends, the delegates from Iowa, Jake Moore and Judge Mitchell, and many others, and was deeply touched and surprised by the spontaneous warmth of the welcome given me by the delegates when I arrived on the convention floor. But I was even more deeply touched by what seemed to me to be a rising tide on the part of the 
rank and file attending this convention, a rising tide of liberalism, which means to me that the democratic process is being revivified more than ever before. This means much of good to the future of this country. And I hope to see a genuinely vital expression of democratic feeling express itself in all branches of our national life. The meeting this evening suggested to me that whatever the outcome of the convention, the democratic people of the United States are on their way toward a continuous, genuine expression of that which they really feel and think. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. You have just heard the Vice President of the United States, Mr. Henry Wallace. This is Martin Ogronsky speaking to you from the Blue Network Studios in the Chicago Stadium and returning you to Bryson Rash in the booth. You have heard an exclusive scoop broadcast of the Blue Network. Mr. Wallace, the Vice President of the United States, is presented by Martin Ogronsky, Blue Network commentator. <laughs>